Hi, welcome back to the south of France and to the sixth of our spectacular walks. Today we're going to make the journey from here, the Rothschild Villa on Saint-Jean Cap Ferrat, down into beautiful Belle Epoque, Beaulieu. Along the way we're going to discover the impact the arrival of the railways had on the town. We're going to find out how a fire almost changed the complete history of the place and we're going to find out why a humble fish restaurant was transformed into a hotel that catered for the likes of Frank Sinatra. So lace up your boots, let's get going! So, the route we're going to take as you come out of the Rothschild Villa, do a sharp left and uh, hold on to your hats today because it is going to be a mighty windy walk. Tell you what, Mr. Boo, I'm glad I get glued my syrup down properly today. So anybody who's not been to saint jean cap Ferrat before, this peninsula, which is sort of midway between Nice and Monaco, Monte Carlo, uh, features some of the most expensive real estate on the planet. According to my research this morning, it goes for anything between 20 and 40,000 euros per square meter. Uh, and that doesn't account for the fact that many of the villas really are sort of in such unique positions that they can, well, they can ask what they like for them. So when you get here, take a right, head down onto the promenade Maurice Rouvier, more commonly known round here as uh, David Niven Walk, and head down to the sea. There's the house what David Niven built, which will uh, feature, I think, in next week's walk. Saint Jean Cap Ferrat become so popular, Mr. Boo. I mean, it just used to be a little fishing village, didn't it? It did, but then King Leopold II of Belgium Ooh. decided he'd buy a plot of land because it was quite a pretty fishing village and with pretty epic views either way. And cheap land at that point. And We're talking land. the end of the what 19th century. Yeah, 1880s, 1890s. Yeah, uh, and he bought a plot of land and then another plot of land, and then another plot of land. I don't know where he got all his money from, do you? No, I think it might have had something to do with the Belgian Congo. Mm, perhaps. But you know, he was, he was just spreading Christian values, wasn't he? It was nothing to do with uh, getting rich. No, just, just, just Christian values. Just Christian values. I think and he spread them onto his, uh, his wife, actually. But didn't, didn't he have a very intriguing private life in that wasn't he... Um, didn't he marry, at age 65, a 16-year-old virgin? I don't think she was a virgin. Oh, no, because she... but she was 16. She was definitely 16 and she definitely wasn't a virgin. She was actually a prostitute. Actually, I say married, I think he was actually having an affair with her and then I think he married her sort of on his deathbed, didn't he? Oh, and left her, left her a fortune in, in villas and shares and uh, diamond mines and the Congo and... That kind of thing. But he was certainly an interesting figure and uh, had a huge influence on this area because when he built, other members of the European aristocracy wanted to come down here. So Queen Victoria came, you know, when she was in mourning for Prince Albert. She used to have a lot of holidays during her mourning, 
But, I mean, why not? She was Queen Victoria. She used to come down on the royal train with about, um, I think, a retinue of about 200 uh, people. Uh, and she was to be seen in Beaulieu riding a horse and carriage. Uh, and she, she had apparently, apparently this is true, uh, there was a sort of, she had a favourite street urchin from Nice who used to get so excited that Queen Victoria was here, he would run alongside the carriage uh, and, and I guess she would, I don't know, toss him bits of Victoria sponge, things like that. True story, I wouldn't lie to you. <laughs> Ooh, I don't think Queen Victoria would have done that. She had to put on a big black bathing suit to get anywhere near the sea. Now, that over there is Vera. <laughs> Vera that, who? That over there is Vera. I haven't, I haven't got my teeth in either this week. That villa over there is Villa Carilos. Now. If you come here, you can buy a joint ticket for the villa that we visited last week, which is the Rothschild Villa and Villa Carilos. Now, the intriguing thing about them is that as villas, they could not be more different. You know, Rothschild is completely over the top. It's like Elton John uh, met Liberace and they decided to set up home together. Carilos is very austere. It is built in the style of a sort of 5th century BC Greek uh, villa, all the furniture, all the fixtures, all the fittings are completely bespoke. So it's absolutely beautiful. It has a unity of purpose. There's no sort of Madame Rothschild style. Oh, I think I'll just have one of those or that antique dealer's come in with something from Egypt. Let's have an Egyptian garden. Um, it's a very different philosophy. And yet, and yet, it was Kerylos that inspired Madame Rothschild to build that great palace and monument to excess up the top there because she was related to the guy who built Kerylos. Uh, I think related through marriage, through Maurice of Frusi. And she came to visit Kerylos. She obviously liked it. She thought, hang on, I'm Madame Rothschild. I'm having a bit of that. And so she went up the top and built one, oh, about 40 times the size. But the wonderful thing is, and something I meant to mention actually last week's uh, video, is that when she died, Madame Rothschild, she left that villa and those nine gardens to the French state, which is why today we can visit, you can visit, we can film, etc., etc. And it's quite interesting when you look around saint jean cap Franc now at the 100, 150 million pound villas with the high gates and the security and the super yachts in the bay, I wonder how many of those people will ultimately bequeath their home to the French state. Time will tell. So this, Mr. Boo, is the Baie des Fourmis. The Did I pronounce that right? The Baie des Fourmis. Baie des Fourmis is so French, isn't it? Now, do you know why it's called the Baie des Fourmis? Tell me. Well, it means, in French, because oh. I'm an expert mm -hmm. on French, it means the Bay of Ants. Now, taking a look at this, you think, why would they call it the Bay of Ants? And yet, if you look closely, the answer is there for you on the beach. Are you itching yet? It's actually because, out at sea, sailors, many years ago, would spy through their telescopes and they would see these mountains of seaweed, particularly in the winter months. And they believed that they looked like mountains of ants. And so this became identified as the Bay of Ants. Apparently. So this hotel up here is one of the great hotels that still survives as a hotel here in Bolia, and this is the Royal Riviera. But it wasn't originally called the Royal Riviera, even though it dates right back to the Belle Epoque. 
It was at one stage called the Bedford Hotel, as many of the hotels were down here, named after sort of English places, which made the, uh, the rich English on their holidays in winter here feel, you know, secure. But it also had another name when it was first made, Mr Boo, didn't it? I think it was originally the Panorama Palace. The Panorama Palace. I think it's a good job they changed that name, don't you? I don't think it's... I don't think time's been very kind to the name Panorama Palace. It sounds like... Uh, well, it sounds like a boarding house in Cleethorpes, doesn't it? With, with sort of pretensions. <laughs> So let's head down onto the beach now, I'll give you a bit of beach action in November. Uh, people still swim here in November, can get a bit chilly. I, I did it last year, didn't I, in lockdown and I, I, I got very, very cold, didn't you I? You did. You had to warm me up, didn't you, with, with, like, with a lot of towels and that. Anyone who's ever been here in summer knows this is one of the uh, one of the rather posh beach bars, clubs, restaurants with some beds and pretty waiters and expensive cocktails. But in winter, it looks like this. something lovely about being on a beach in November. It's stolen time, don't you think? Even if you've got to wear a jumper. Yeah, it's kind of a day like today. You kind of feel you shouldn't be here, that it's winter, and that you've just had a little, a little reprieve, day out of jail. reminds me seeing the 100 bus to Monaco that you know there was a time I think up until the Second World War when there was a tram here that ran all the way along this coastline it ran right the way from Nice to Monte Carlo I think it even ran through to Monton didn't it Wow I think but it certainly came right through Beaulieu right through Es um, and if I can find them I'll put you some incredible old pictures of uh, of when the tram came to Beaulieu it's ironic, of course, because uh, they're now building tram after tram after tram. <laughs> and it's only 60 years ago that they got rid of them all because, of course, cars were the future. Mind you, I was the future once. Hard to believe, I know. So this is the casino of Beaulieu sur Mer. Uh, and interestingly, it was, I think, built in the days of the Belle Epoque. I can't quite remember whether a section of it was designed by uh, Gustav Eiffel, who was the guy who designed the Eiffel Tower, because, of course, Eiffel has a villa, or did have a villa just along here, uh, and did design quite a lot of buildings along the Côte d'Azur. But what I do know is that this casino featured in the movie Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. You know, the one with Steve Martin and Michael Caine and some of it's shot in Villefranche. You know, he walks along the seafront and he, uh, he pushes an old lady into the sea. It's very cruel. Um, but this was the casino. But, of course, they renamed the town. It wasn't beaulieu sur -Mer. It was beaumont sur -Mer. But this building behind me is one of the great buildings of the Belle Epoque. This is what was originally the Bristol Hotel. And it was built in about 1895, 1896. It was built very quickly to try and capture the boom in tourism amongst the British who were coming here for the winters. And this was a grand palace. I think it had about 250 rooms. It had heated seawater, a sort of central heating system that kept, kept everyone warm in the winter months. Uh, it had 
salons and libraries and musical rooms. Uh, it had a rotund at the far end here where they had tea dancers, tea dancers for the uh, for the well-to-do British. <laughs> But then, in March 1911, disaster struck. It was about 10.30 at night, and a man was getting off the train in Beaulieu. And as he got off the train, he noticed that there were sparks coming up from the roof of the Bristol. Well, he hot-footed it down here to tell the doorman. The doorman went inside, but by the time he got inside, he detected that there was smoke and flames coming from the top two floors. The fire brigade were called. It was a new fire brigade in Beaulieu. It had only recently been established, I think, in something like 1905. They came, but the flames were really taking hold. And by midnight, a decision was taken to summon help from Nice and from the mountains. And the Chasseur Alpin came down with their vehicles. And eventually, the fire was extinguished at 4 a.m. But by that stage, the top two floors of the building had been entirely destroyed. And you might think that that is where the story of the Bristol building ends. But unbelievably, the whole hotel was reopened in the winter of that year. But it was reopened with a completely new top. The top two floors were never restored. The main building had actually survived because it was largely built of concrete. But amazingly, by the winter of 1911, the whole place was good to go again. And it was full because Beaulieu was the place to come. At this stage, there was something like 82 hotels in the town. This was converted into a hospital in the war, it's taboo. Really? As were many of the uh, great hotels along this coastline. The Negresco was a field hospital in Nice. Uh, and then again, when the terrorist attack happened, when the uh, Bastille night attack came, it became a sort of field hospital that night as well too. Did you know the Bedford Hotel was never turned into a hospital during the war, but it was turned into a school for orphans during the war? Oh. What's weird about the Residency Fell is it's been sort of empty for years and years and it's a most fantastic villa and I think it's been purchased by somebody who's very rich and has bought it with the hotel next door and there's something about planning permission. But what were you saying about it? It was used as the press image of, uh, for Riviera oh. and Georgina's on the balcony looking out probably saying that she's in grass or somewhere else because they're never in the right place when they say Before they're in the right place. Before she's attacked by criminals or, or a helicopter flies into her. Yeah, or a boat explodes. Or, or a boat explodes, yeah. Art gets stolen. It's always like that down here. There's a few dirty deeds done. I've heard. So this is La Reserve de Beaulieu, one of the great hotels closed at the minute because it costs the hotels here tend to close between November uh, until about December the 23rd, my birthday in fact. They reopened for my birthday. Um, but this originally was just a modest little fish restaurant. It was opened by a guy from Nice and I think it takes its name, La Reserve, from the, the tanks that they used to store the fresh fish in. Uh, but of course it became very successful and as you may have seen in one of my other videos about the man called James Gordon Bennett, uh, it became the place where Gordon Bennett ran his American newspaper empire from. And it was here that Gordon Bennett ruled the roost. He even had installed at his own expense the first ever telephone on the French Riviera. 
but it eventually became so successful that the stars of the world came Frank Sinatra, Edith Piaf, Charlie Chaplin, David Niven, Elizabeth Taylor, etc., etc. And uh, famously, right towards the end of his life, the uh, the English eccentric English film director Michael Winner, who loved Beaulieu and loved to come here, uh, spent about three weeks here and it cost him a cool 47,000 quid. And then nobody could work out after his death why he didn't leave much. I think Michael spent it all. And what a way to go. Did you know that Beaulieu used to be part of Villefranche until about 1891? Really? Yeah, they decided just in 1890, I think they decided they'd had enough and they wanted their own to be their own town and be a separate oh. entity. Oh, um, and um, who, whose idea was that? Well, everyone kind of had been waiting and wanting to do it for ages. And it was the mayor, Mr. Marianini, who has the marketplace named after him. Oh. Uh, it was the mayor who uh, decided to put the vote into place. Oh, they had a plebiscite, a bit like Brexit. A bit like Brexit. And, and then they were out. Out. They were out of Villefranche. Out. We're out. Freedom. So, Beaulieu Railway Station. These days, not so glamorous. But in 1868, this was the place to be. Because in 1868, the railways arrived in Beaulieu sur Mer and it changed everything. Because what happened was the very, very glamorous Tran Blur emerged. The wagon leads, the sleeping coaches that people would board in central London. And they would go down to Dover and then they would get the boat across and then they would uh, get back onto the boat train on the other side, which would then take them round Paris where it would collect other rather well-to-do people and then it would drive them from the northern freezing cold northern foggy winter and they would arrive here on the Côte d'Azur in the brilliant sunshine. And here they would spend their winters in hotels like the Bristol and the Bedford and the Windsor and the Victoria. It was a different world. And it's of course no coincidence that the first building you see as you leave Beaulieu railway station is the Palais Anglais, the Palace of the English. Boulevard Marianini and it's a very suitable place to end our trip because uh, this is the boulevard that was named after the man who made Beaulieu independent from Villefranche. If you've enjoyed this video hit the subscription button, hit the like button, it makes a huge difference, it doesn't cost you a penny and I blow you lots of kisses and uh, we shall see you on the next one when we're going to go all the way into Saint-Jean. Bye.